everyone, welcome to our webinar and it's part seven of unexpected diagnosis based on whole genome sequencing. I would like to start with technical instructions because we would really like to be together with you and we are happy to make this webinar really interactive, although it's online and we are happy to address all your questions and looking forward for your comments and suggestions. So in order to ask question, you have in the menu Q&A section, you just simply press it. You can do it during the webinar. Also, when a questions are being asked, you can also do it. And then you will get the field where you can type your question. And then you simply send uh, the question and we will immediately sort them by topics and address them after Professor Royce will finalize his slides. So after the webinar, you can all get certificates and it's extremely important that you need to carefully um, complete the form so that your all details are correct. So this automatically after the webinar, you will get uh, their uh, certificate of attendance of our webinar. And now I would like really to give a short intro of Professor Dr. Andrals, although we all know him very well and uh, he does not really require the introduction, but I would like to give some key facts from his uh, biography. Uh, actually, it is very exciting, but Professor Royce introduced PCI in Europe, so he was the first one who has done it in Europe. He has published more than 400 uh, papers in the renowned journals, and um, Professor Royce and his team and his colleagues diagnosed more, more than 1 million patients. And we are looking uh, very much forward for today's webinar with Professor Rolls. And what I would like to highlight that uh, our next webinar will be done by Dr. Gabriela Oprea, the genetic le landscape of developmental regression and the registration will be open today. So we are looking forward for our next webinar after Professor Royce's webinar. And now I would like to give the word to Professor Dr. Antrons. Hola, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure listening to you. And it's also my pleasure to start today again, a further session regarding unexpected diagnosis based on whole genome sequencing. And it's really also always a pleasure to have this as an interactive uh, communication. So indeed, as uh, Ola has mentioned, do me the favor, address as many questions you would like to have. There is never ever any stupid question. There are only stupid answers. Therefore, let us know what you would like to know. Um, Ola has just mentioned in the example, uh, why so this standard question, why is genome better than the exon? And I would like to start with the first slide, and this is just happening by accident, giving you a little bit an overview why we are so convinced that the whole genome will be in a very short time period, the golden standard in genetic testing. And we can, with the genome, move towards the next step in a modern molecular medicine and forget all of those alternative smaller tests that have been developed necessarily in the last 20 years, like the MLPA, like DPCR, qPCR, like the panels, like the single gene, because the advantages of all of these tests are perfectly covered in the meanwhile with a good sequencing technology and especially an excellent bioinformatic pipeline. And therefore allow me, because I've realized that there are some colleagues being the first time in this webinar to give you a very short overview. And the first remarkable characteristics of the genome is that with the combination of a good sequencing technology and an excellent bioinformatic pipeline, it is really the one fits it all product. If we see it a little bit from the commercial side, that means no need for all of these additional tests because the genome covers the advantages, their sensitivity and their specificity. 
And I would always like to remind all of us that there is a wonderful reference program, and this is the Genomic England program. We can learn from the guys from the Genomic England program, started roughly about 70 years ago, very nicely, that with the early implementation of the genome in the diagnostic process, you can not only reduce significantly the diagnostic odyssey of all of our patients from more than five years to less than six months, we can also significantly reduce the costs that are normally have to be spent for the diagnosis of the patients from more than 20,000 uh, per pounds to less than 2,000. The well done genome, and we have named our genome the My Life genome because we would like to underline that it has really a, significantly, a significant impact, not only for the diagnosis of a potential affected individual, but also to the prevention of diseases. So my life genome covers the mitochondrial genome, complex recombination, repeat expansions, UDPs, uh, and so on. And especially the topic of the covering of all of the complex structural variants, like the recombination, like the insertions, like the duplications, or even the balanced translocations, can so nicely analyzed and therefore be part of a diagnostic report around the MyLife genome. Because of that, we are so impressed to demonstrate that this modern technology allows a diagnostic yield of 77%. That's extraordinary high. You will see later on that this is close to double the diagnostic yield compared to the whole exome sequencing. The short turnaround time is an extremely important characteristics because we would like to demonstrate that the genome has a clinical impact. And I'm a clinician in my heart. Uh, I have been working for more than 20 years in the hospitals. So I know how important it is that the reports will be sent back as soon as possible, that it has really an impact to the clinical decisional process of our clinical colleagues. And there is a further wonderful advantage, we believe, that makes it really so simple in the future. This is the fact that everything what we are doing is based on a buckle swap. That means easy uh, sampling at home is doable, and it's even FDA approved that the individuals can do it by themselves. And there is a further element I would not like to forget, and I will introduce later on one case to you to underline why this is so important. And this is the quarterly updated report. Let's be super clear. In the past, we have sent out a report when we have received material from a patient with a clinical question. And we had a little bit the impression that with sending out a high quality report, the job was done. This is wrong. In the meanwhile, we clearly understand that with sending out the first report, our job starts. Why? Every month, roughly one and a half thousand highly sophisticated, very well done scientific papers have uh, been published. And it's very clear. We have to digest the information from those papers and try to get them enrolled in the medical diagnostic reports as fast as possible. And that's the reason why we decided whenever we have sent out the first report, every quarter an updated report follows that is based on the extracted very recent information coming from papers, coming from public data banks, coming also from our own data bank. So these are clearly the huge advantages. And here I have summarized some technical elements in the direct comparison of the genome to the exome. And let me just remind all of us, the exome just covers 1% of the genetic information. With the genome, especially now with a new T2T, a wayable sequence recently published in March this year, we cover really 100% of the entire genetic information. And that results in 77% of a diagnostic yield. Why? Because we are able to demonstrate the 4 million single nucleotide variants that makes each individual different from the second and from the third. And the challenge for sure is out of these roughly 4 million, now to prove which one of these 4 million is really causing the disease. And the most important technical advantage around the genome is that it covers so nicely the complex structural variants as I have already mentioned it. 
However, beside that, there is also a significant technical advantage. And let me quickly demonstrate this slide to you because it so nicely shows one of the limitations of the axon. And this is the fact that for the axon sequencing, we have one laboratory step, and this is the enrichment step. And there are some commercial kits available. We have tested it for some of those. The names are given on the right side. And you see, even though these are perfectly validated kits for the enrichment step, there are significant differences in the configuration of the exon stretches that can, can be covered with the whole exon sequencing. So look at the first line in blue, followed by the orange, the pink, and the gray. And you see immediately that for the exon stretches, the configuration of the mountains are really different. And compared with the last lane, the green one, here you see a very nice, very uniform, very homogeneous signal intensity. And that's exactly the result of the genome. We don't have an enrichment step. And that's the reason why the technicality of the genome also argues why we have an improvement in the diagnostic rate. We have summarized this on the next slide. Roughly six to nine percent of whole axon negative patients cases will get positive, can be identified and clarified because the genome covers the complex structural variants I have introduced to you. Seven to 12 percent depends on the genes. We of the whole axon negative cases are getting positive based on intronic and regulatory variants that are pathogenic and causing therefore and explaining the phenotype. And last but not least, because of the technical differences, no enrichment necessary and the better uniform and homogeneous coverage, additional six to 10% of the cases that have been initially whole exome negative are getting clarified with the genome. And if you put these three parameters together, you end up in the 77% of a diagnostic rate. Allow me just to show you one example. And you may not all be an expert in the next generation sequencing, but even with your own eyes, you can immediately see the differences between the lower lane that shows the results for the whole exome sequencing for a given gene, the name is given, it's selenon. And in the blue boxes, uh, in the very lower lane, you see the exome stretches. And you see exome sequencing failed to cover the third box from the left side. I've highlighted this with a red circle. Go to the upper sequencing results coming from the whole genome sequencing, exactly the same patient, just with the whole genome. You see how nicely and how homogeneously the genome covers the entire stretch. And therefore, not a big surprise that the exon can miss variants, mutations, pathogenic variants. And the genome is able to demonstrate these in a very nice quality setting. There's a further very interesting topic. Now, I would also like to underline that. And this is the topic that we should never forget in the past. Majority of the laboratories, and this is unfortunately still the case, are using the Caucasian reference genome as the reference. This is for sure based on the bias that is coming from the majority of the public available data banks, where 90% plus of the genomic data that are available there are coming from the Caucasians. So only slowly we see more and more input from other ethnicities. However, the ethnicity specific genomic information, we call it the reference genome for the individual ethnicities, is so important to further improve the quality of the interpretation. And here I would like to show you one example how precisely you can use such data if you have a good own internal data bank and not depending on the publicly available data banks that definitely will need some further years to reach for other ethnicities like for the Arabic population, the Indian population, the Japanese population, the same quality of content as we have already received it for the Caucasian. And here you see based on a very nice collaboration with our wonderful partners in Pakistan, especially with the children's hospitals in Lahore, a cohort we analyzed where we have been interested to analyze whether we are able to differentiate even within the population of Pakistan, the different ethnicities. 
And here you see we have clustered using a so-called principal component analysis, the different cohorts we have been analyzed. And you can show very nicely that for sure, the population in Lahore is a different one compared to Peshawar, compared to Islamabad or Karachi and Multan, just based on the whole genome sequencing data. This is a study being done by our colleague, Dr. Abhishek, based on more than 600 uh, individuals from Pakistan. So you can see you are not only able to use it for an ethnicity specific environment, you can even go a level deeper and substratify for the different tribes, for the different populations that are living in these areas. So this is a further huge advantage, again, around the concept, let's develop for each ethnicity its own, its specific whole genome as a reference. This has a direct positive impact. And I would just like to show you one slide from our colleague, Dr. Najim, where he has been able to compare on the left side, the filtering process and the stratification on a real life example of a patient without our reference genome data bank to the right side with the internal census reference genome bank. And you see, we start in both cases with more than 320,000 variants. And here we have used the smart filtering, a very unique technology that has allows us to significantly reduce on the one side the burden because computational time is time and money. And on the other side, improve the quality. So with the reference genome on the left side, you end up once you have done the filtering and taking the healthy individuals, as a parameter with more than 100,000 variants. On the right side, 86,000. Next step, checking for the biological implication and impact, more than 1,000 left side, 600 on the right side. Matching it with the received clinical information, HPOs, human phenotype ontology, 99 on the left side, 58 on the right side. And last but not least, at the end of the entire process with the bioinformatic pipeline, you have 14 variants on the left side that might explain the disease of the patient. And now the clinicians, the geneticists, and the molecular biologists have to sit together and decide which one is best explaining the phenotype of the patient. And compared with the right side, you end up in five. So five, you might argue, oh, that's not the big difference to 14. Oh, it is the big difference because it massively reduces the workload internally for the interpretation, and it reduces significantly the risk and the burden we are typically bringing to the clinician if we end up in the variant of unclear significance or WISP. With that smart filtering and using the reference genome, we reduce the numbers of WISP for more than 90% and improve the quality massively in the reports we are sending out. So this is modern technology and this is the way how we would like to see molecular genomic medicine positioned in the next years. So allow me to demonstrate you a case. I've shown some further webinars before only to some part, but with that case, you get even a better insight how we are implementing the different steps in the interpretation of the data we are generating based on the genome. This is a patient from Southeast Asia the patient has been described for us suffering from seizures, e.g. abnormality, intellectual disability, motor delay, and microcephaly. The whole axiom was negative. And you see we have a very informative family and given in the pedigree, non-consanguineous. However, three affected kids in the next generation. So if the first thing we always do is that the clinical colleagues try to extract the important information we are receiving. Because sometimes, and you will see this in my second case, it's a very detailed and partially confusing information that is just handed over by all clinical colleagues. So here it was simple, because it is on the one side, the neurodevelopmental problem we have seen, plus the epileptic pattern and the metabolic component based on the hyperammonemia. So it could be either, if you categorize it, a neurometabolic disorder or neurodevelopmental delay with epileptic encephalopathy. So you take this case, 
You do the genome, you end up in the 4 million variants I've introduced to you. We are able to identify with the genome being different to the reference and not only 200,000 as we see it in the axon. Then you go through the bioinformatic pipeline analyzing the shared variants, the frequency, the impact in the HPO terms. And in this case, we identified in a gene called NIPB a mutation a variant at the position 146 C2A. Now for sure, we have to clarify, what do we know about that variant? And you take in the first step, the public away of a reference data banks, in that case, the GNOMAT. So we checked it for the GNOMAT for the version 2.11, and one variant allele has been described. So you can easily calculate out of the 30,000, now the frequency ending up in an extremely low frequency as it's been depicted here. The GNOMAT version 3.12, the variant has not been described. The more rarer such a variant is in the International Data Bank, the more likely you can believe that it has really a biological implication. In the next step, you run with the variant through all of the theoretical prediction programs. So you see on the left side, the names of those prediction programs, the SIF, the polyphane, the mutation taster, the mutation assessor, and so on. And you see that in the overall majority, the prediction based on the theoretical programs is ending up in an information it's either damaging or deleterious. And the likelihood that it is really causing a damaging variant has been calculated very high. So this is a consistent information that here we can expect to have really a damaging variant in the gene NAPB I've shown to you. And then we need our biologists because we would like to understanding, okay, however, is this explaining the clinical phenotype? So what is the biological consequence if we have a deleterious variant in this gene? And then we check that it has been described clearly that this NIPB gene encodes a cofactor being involved in the so-called scenario complex dependent synaptic vesicle fusion and recycling process. So that's a brain derived functional disturbance. And there is a further argument very nicely supporting that it can explain the brain symptoms we have seen in our patients based on the fact that the NIPB is more or less exclusively expressed in the brain tissue. So no expression in colon, no expression in the liver or in the lung and so on. So that's a further evidence that this variant in this gene is really explaining our phenotype. Sometimes you are lucky and you see that there is also a transgenic animal model existing. So in this case, mice being homozygous for a knockout allele exhibit severe recurrent epileptic seizures. And you remember, also our patient is suffering from epilepsy. And in the mice, it's even followed by ataxia, which has also been described in our patients. So it's getting more and more consistent that this variant in this gene really explains the phenotype. And then you check what has been published regarding the phenotype, what has been published in the literature in the internationally available literature regarding the functional consequence. And here we have quickly extracted with the mastermind functionality, which is the key basis of the continuous extraction of the monthly 1,500 publications. And I have just highlighted in red, the functional consequence, epilepsy, rare epilepsy, cerebellar symptoms, early onset epileptic encephalopathy, or epilepsy associated problems, or even autism. So you see also the very few papers that have been published up to that time, especially in 2021, really clearly underlining that there is a clinical association between that gene and the phenotype. So allow me to summarize the evidence. So we see on the one side in the model of the disease, a very nice overlay to our clinical phenotype because this has been described as being a disorder of the synaptic vesicle fusion machinery. It's autism recessive, explains the pedigree. It's more or less exclusively exp expressed in the brain. The transgenic mice model develops severe recurrent epileptic seizures. And also in the clinical evidence, we see an epileptic encephalopathy. And then the final step for sure, in the ideal case, we would like to have a 3D protein structure and functional analysis, which is unfortunately for sure 
not yet existing in a big number of variants we can identify. Let me come to the end, and the end is my second case. This is a six-year-old male patient from consanguineous parents, no specific disease in the family history. What I have done, I have just copied from the reports we have received some of the sentences. And I'm quickly clicking through this clinical information because it's really so important that you're really getting an impression. It is sometimes not easy for the clinicians to extract the key message and the key information from the individual patients. And we say, don't worry, leave it in us because it's better to get more information and get extracting the key information than sometimes getting a very fragment information that might lead you in the wrong direction of the interpretation. And I would like to remind all of us, we have published some years ago, a very nice paper. The key message of that paper was, the more clinical information we are receiving in the ideal case based on the HPO terminology, the higher is the diagnostic rate. So it does not cost any additional cent. A more detailed description is a traumatic guarantee of the improvement of the diagnostic rate in the patients. So we extracted the information. Now that's the part of our medical experts. We did a genetic test. And the key message here I would like to present to you that there was an external test done with the axiom, it was negative. We repeated in January this year, the genome, it was also negative. But then because, and I introduced this to you, we are doing a quarterly updated report. We reanalyzed re this automatically end of March and it was becoming positive. So what happened? I mentioned to you that the most important advantage of the genome is that we can so perfectly identify based on the improvement of the bioinformatic pipelines, bigger and larger structural variants. And that's exactly what happened here. With the improvement and the further improvement of the structural variant identification, we have been able to demonstrate in the axon seven of a gene that has been mentioned here, ZNFX1, that we have a 1.8 KB deletion that was initially without this very sophisticated reanalysis for the structural variant not being described. What do we know from that gene? We know it's on the one side, a member of the RNA helicase superfamily that is responsible for immune responses against RNA virus infection. Mutations in these genes are associated with immunodeficiency type 91 and partially also hyperinflammation. And therefore the patients are demonstrating the classical immunodeficiency syndrome picture, which is typically the combination of fever infection, thrombocytopenia, renal or hepatic dysfunction, recurrent infections, and typically as a complication, also sometimes some seizures. So this was the clarification of our patient. It has a massive impact for the management, the treatment of our patient, because if we understand that this is a hereditary immunodeficiency syndrome, the treatment can be adjusted. And in these patients, immunoglobulin replacement treatment is the treatment of choice. And immediately with the initiation of this treatment, the patient massively stabilized, and even some of the neurological complications could be perfectly stabilized. I mentioned to you uh, that sometimes we have a complication regarding the uh, brain because of meningitis. So what is the take home message from this case? Always try to get it better in the next step. And therefore the quarterly updated report it combines the improvement of the technical progress, or especially of the pipeline. Plus, it allows you to integrate newly described genes is the basis for the continuous counseling of our patients. Especially initially in negative cases, we take a very clear responsibility to continuously reanalyze. And now based on the first 12 months statistics, we know that those that have been initially negative can be get positive with a likelihood at 6.5%, which has to be added to the 77% I mentioned at the beginning of my talk as the initial diagnostic rate. Therefore, it is really our motivation 
that we would like to reanalyze continuously all of our cases. We would like to always integrate the best knowledge and the most recent understanding of genetics in our reports to always allow our patients to get as early as possible diagnosed. Thank you. Now, I guess we're starting with the Q&A session. Uh, thank you so much, Professor yes, Rose. Exactly. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful webinar. And I would like to start our questions. There are a lot of questions. And the first question comes from Lebanon. Is whole genome sequencing helpful in the diagnosis of prostate cancer? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I didn't talk today about cancer. This is the topic for my next webinar. Uh, however, let's be very clear. With the genome, we're learning better and better that especially lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer anyway, and the prostate cancer, we understand the biology better and better. And let me quickly add some comments on that. On the one side, what we realize for sure in the cancers that the recombination events and the structural variants are more and more frequently identified with a more frequently um, usage of the whole genome. So the concept of expecting a single missense mutation that might explain the etiology of the cancer we have to leave behind of us, and we are realizing it's getting more complex. Number two, as we have already learned in the last years regarding the colon cancer, we understand better and better. That's obviously a little bit a topic of the dosage of the combination of different variants or mutations. So in the prostate cancer, there has only been one gene prescribed, this TBNFX3, that has a relevant implication in the increase of the likelihood of developing cancer. But it seems to be more and more important that we see this under the dosage phenomenon. So the cumulative uh, um, appearance and presence of a different variants. And last but not least, the headline therefore goes, especially for the cancer, from monogenic hypotheses or pathophysiological concepts towards polygenic pathophysiological concepts. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Rolfs, um, there is a very exciting question. In case the patient comes from a lineage which is highly outbreed ethnicity, for example, parents are from East and West, how uh, will you choose the reference genome for such a case? Oh, that's really a very interesting question. We have discussed this very extensively. And to be honest to you, we have not yet really a clear answer to that. Uh, and at the end of the day, either we have to do this for individual stretches where we can clearly demonstrate where specific parts of the chromosomes are more likely coming from. This is one concept we are actually following with our bioinformatic pipeline, but again, not yet finally decided. Or the alternative is that we are just defining a cutoff and we decided from the majority of the information that can be identified. So make a long story short, here we are not yet at the end in the understanding what is the best technical solution, but we are working on that. And I'm pretty sure end of this year, beginning of the next year, we have a very nicely validated concept around that. But I like the question, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Rolls, could you briefly explain how tandem repeats are diagnosed using whole genome sequencing? Well, it is rather easy since we do not have the enrichment on the one side, therefore we do not have this compression artifacts on the other side that is typically a consequence in the, in the technology for the whole exome sequencing. On the one side, on the other side with 30X coverage rate for the nuclear genome, and the 1000x for the mitochondrial genome, the quality of the sequencing process is really perfectly settled. We validated this very carefully at the beginning to have a basis to decide what is the perfect coverage rate we should use for the diagnostic processes. And the 30x was finally the best compromise 
between pricing on the one side and quality you can expect. And therefore, especially the repeat expansions with the precise bioinformatic pipelines, and I guess that's the intention of this question, can be perfectly identified and perfectly clarified in the quantitative way, especially for the so-called type one repeat expansions, where we know we are typically talking about 60, 80, 100, 200 repeat expansions in contrast to the type two, like the, mitochondria, like the myotonic dystrophy or free trash ataxia, where we have thousands of repeats. With the thousands of repeats, sometimes the genome comes to its limitation, but it's for the diagnosis and for the prognosis irrelevant whether we have 5,000 or 6,500 repeats finally, for example, in the myotonic dystrophy. Thank you very much. What about the cost differences between whole genome and other tests? Wow, that's a good question. I like it. Uh, for sure, the genome is still a little bit more expensive. But allow me just to give you maybe just some very general pricings. And we are aware for sure that there are big differences in different countries and also in the different healthcare systems. But in the mean, the axiom is in the mean while offered in the majority of the markets between 500 and 700 US dollars. So that's a fair price. I can't phrase it differently because we are really working on the economy of scaling for the genome and based on the huge numbers of genomes we are processing every week. We are able to offer the genome in the range of about 1,100 to 1,200. You can argue it's still roughly doubling the price of the axiom. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. But have in mind also that you do not need any further additional or alternative test, which has typically to be done if you do the axiom, like the MLPA, because you miss the structural variance. Or sometimes also you are missing the QPC, or you have to do the QPCR because you are missing quantitative parameters. And the price of the genome goes down in the next years. That's also motivating us to strongly believe that it will not take more than two years when the genome has taken at least 95% of the indications for a genetic testing because the quality is so convincing. Thank you very much. Is it possible to use genome to prevent dangerous diseases like cancer if you are asymptomatic? That's an excellent question. And the clear answer is yes. Allow me to give you this very well-known example, and you all know it, but it underlines so clearly how important it is that we are progressing in the modern medicine away from the diagnosis of problems towards the prevention of problems. So you all remember Angelina Jolie's story, mother and aunt passed away because of a mutation in the PRCA1 gene resulting in a very aggressive form in the breast cancer. So she informed the press media, Angelina Jolie, that she got tested genetically and she was also positive. And she decided to do the preventive operations like for example, the mastectomy. With this mastectomy, in this case, with a very clear, well-known mutation, we re reduce the risk to develop breast cancer in the following five years from roughly about 100% based on this specific mutation that was been known to close to 0%. That's a form of prevention. Or take easier examples like the hereditary hypercholesterolemia, where we are aware the first 20 or 30 years, you might not do well any, develop any problem, but suddenly you're starting suffering from myocardial infarction or cerebellar stroke because of the disastrous consequences of the significantly increased cholesterol concentration in the blood. Identify it early and treat it early and you have a normal life expectation according to all of the data that are existing. So it's absolutely clear with a better understanding of the interpretation and an improvement of our knowledge, which variant is causing in what ethnicity a clear phenotype. We are moving very fast towards the direction of preventing diseases. Thank you very much. What about the deafness? Because we have a lot of patients with deafness where whole exome sequencing result is negative. How should we proceed? 
Yeah, that's an absolutely important question because deafness indeed, especially in some of the Arabic countries, but also in the southern part of Europe or in Central Africa, is unfortunately very, very frequent. We know, and the deafness is a wonderful example, how important we have to early identify and diagnose the patients because an early intervention gives the patients a normal development of the speech and therefore also of the, in the entire life. Therefore, the early diagnosis is so critical. We know from very good summarizing reviews regarding the deafness that even in highly informative pedigrees, in one third of the families, there has been no gene described or been identified that could explain the deafness. So it means very clearly we are missing a significant percentage of the reasons why the kids are developing the deafness. And the genome has the huge capability because of the significantly higher diagnostic rate to improve this situation and allow the patients to get early identified and massively better diagnosed. Now I would say this one third we are missing is on the one side, the consequence, because with the actually existing technologies, the majority of structural variants have been missed. And on the other side, new genes have not been properly characterized and therefore the final diagnosis was also not given. Therefore deafness is a wonderful example how critical it is that we are offering parents and kids the chance of an early diagnosis. Thank you very much. How do you identify mosaism? Example, if there is no mutation present in the sample that is analyzed, there is a good chance that mutation is tissue specific. Could you please comment on that? Wow, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, we just recently had a case with our colleague from Georgia, um, Dr. Tika, um, where the patient was analyzed, uh, where the blood was taken initially, and the result was negative. So we are doing the buckle swap, the buckle sampling. And in the buckle swap, we could identify clearly a mosaicism for a very specific mutation in the very dedicated gene complex. And then we were thinking about what does it mean? Is it because the first laboratory who did the negative result missed something? No, most likely not the case. It's just underlining that sometimes for some of the case, it has also been described in the literature, mosaicism can be tissue specific or organ specific. Therefore the recommendation in such cases for sure is clearly if you have an initially negative test, independent whether it would be the exome or a panel testing, doing the next step, the genome using the buckle swap, because this has the huge advantage in increasing massively the likelihood that you are identifying the variant. And if it's in mosaism that we can perfectly quantify it, I mentioned that at the beginning, we can quantify it up to roughly about 5% of the individual uh, populations within the DNA. So that's a high sensitivity for the identification of mosaicisms. Thank you very much. Have you ever had false positive results? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess we should differentiate what could it mean if we're talking about false positive. It could be a technical false positive. It means the genome shows you a signal or variant that is finally not existing. You may remember that with a 30, 30x coverage rate, you can more or less exclude that because you see with your own eyes how frequently at the given position you identify a specific variant. However, it's not a guarantee that this might not be happen as a technical artifact. Therefore, what we are doing for the majority of the variants, especially those which we see the first time, we do a Sanger confirmation. But the Sanger confirmation in the past, we did it for every variant in the MIWA, we do it less and less frequently because the Sanger is in 99.99% really confirming what we have seen in the genome. There might be some very, very few exceptions. And especially in this what is the rule we are following. If it's the first time a variant we have never seen before, especially in an AT rich stretch, we do the Sanger for the confirmation. There might be a false positivity regarding the clinical phenotype. And that's a really difficult task to be honest to you because we might 
describe a variant and therefore a disease that is not in any way fitting with the clinical phenotype of the individual. What do we do in such a case? We talk with our clinical colleague, because again, there are three explanations. Either the patient is in the pre-symptomatic stage, so has not yet developed symptoms. Third, the doctor might have overseen some of the symptoms, or third, it is indeed a false positive. You see, it's a very complex uh, decision algorithm. So I would say at least what I can answer, I do not remember a single case where we have not been able with a given likelihood to either decide that this is a pre-symptomatic or whether this is the case where some of the symptoms are reflecting heterogeneity in the very broad spectrum of a given phenotype. Thank you so much. Uh, we still have lots of unanswered questions and please write us directly and we will answer all your questions also to you and thank you very much for such a great participation and so many valid questions and answers. And thank you very much, Professor Rolfs. And uh, with that, I would thank like you. to conclude our webinar. And, and Ola, today... sorry that I'm interrupting you. Do not forget to talk about the CME certificate. Exactly. As I have introduced you in the beginning, you can apply for CME certificate. You just need to complete the form correctly, write your details, and it will be generated for you individually, as mentioned in the beginning. And we are looking forward to our next webinar with Dr. Gabriela Oprea, and you can start registration now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.